Irish tonight looking for victory number 84 on the season and trying to lock up second place in the National League East. We're in the ninth. It's a one run ball game. The Pirates leading three to two. Oh boy, quick outs. Come on, get ahead, stay there. Get, get a fly ball right here. Come on. One out, one on. Top of the ninth. Pirates lead by one. Ground ball through the right side, base hit. Okendo around second on his way to third. The throw comes into second base. The Cardinals have the tying run at third and only one out here in the ninth inning. Come on, get that ground ball right here. Come on. Get that ground ball. Pitch fly ball center field Vance like is there tagging is Okendo here comes the throw the tag at the plate is out and the ball game is over a double play to win the ball game Andy Vance like threw it on the fly to home plate he cuts down Jose Okendo the value blocked the plate he would not allow him to score and the Pirates have locked up second place in the National League East for 1988. in my mind that I always have that chance uh, that slight possibility of, of coming up with a great play in the outfield and and if you don't think that way great things will never happen to you and when the ball was hit to me uh, I knew it was going to be a tough play because it was a line drive but I said let's just go for it and I, I caught it I grabbed it and I just heaved hoped it and it happened to go right on top of the plate and Mike made a great play to complete what ended up being a, uh, a pretty good play to clinch second place. <laughs> organization has something to be proud of. It's just too bad that all the people in the office and everywhere else don't get nice contacts like we get because everybody's busted for this. It was an emotional night for manager Jim Leland. After all, in just three short years, he had seen his team climb from the basement of the National League East to contenders. Quite a contrast from 1985, when there was no talk of being in contention, only of a franchise that had hit rock bottom. Not only on the field, but in the hearts of its fans. And with the team up for sale, Pittsburgh was about to lose its Pirates. I guess it don't sound like much to anybody else, but to, to go from 756,000 people in the stands a year before we got here to break the all-time record, which I, I, I want to take this time to thank the fans, they, and they've been unbelievable. To just see what's happened here in a short period of time, it is, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's almost overwhelming. What a remarkable turnaround. The Bucks were back, and the fans loved it. You might say the 1988 Pittsburgh Pirates were proud again. Historic Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The stars and stripes, the fireworks, all the pomp and circumstance that goes with opening day here at Veteran Stadium. 1988 is underway, and the Bucks start off with a bang by coming from behind to beat the Phillies. Coles with a drive, deep left field. It's high, it's deep, it is history. Buckos lead 4-2. Three days later, it's off to St. Louis and the home opener for the defending National League champions. Center field, Vance like diving catch, oh, one away. Baby. Once again, the Bucks play spoilers and go on to win two of three from the Cardinals. Now to Three River Stadium, where an anxious city gets ready to welcome back its Buckos. The big thing there was the, the anticipation. It seemed like the winter lasted so long that you just couldn't wait to see how the people were going to react and then to come in here opening night and, and have that kind of response. So it's unbelievable. I mean, it's almost overwhelming. With a first pitch from Pittsburgh's own Mr. Rogers that was out of Mike Lavalier's neighborhood, the home season was underway. 
And if this game was any indication of how the season would go, Pirate fans were in for a pleasant surprise. Well, maybe, but can you say jam? That's what the Bucks were in, leading 2-1 to one in the sixth, when Philadelphia loaded the bases with no outs. Vicente Palacios relieved and got the first two batters. Two outs. Steve Jeltz was next. And again, the fans bring up the volume in Three Rivers Stadium. Palacios ready from the stretch. The one-two pitch. Hit in the air to left field. Yeah. Bob backpedals yeah. near the line. He's got it. The yeah. inning is over. Palacios out of the bullpen to shut the door. The final nails in the coffin were driven in by Mike Lavalier in the eighth. Two pitch. Lavalier line shot right center field. An extra base hit. Bonilla scores. Green scores. Reynolds will cross the plate. Spanky's done it again. A three-run double, and the Pirates lead the Philadelphia Phillies five to one. Here's the windup for the one-one pitch. Bounce to the right side. This will do it. Lean to Bream. Ball game is over. The Buckos defeat the Philadelphia Phillies, and there was no doubt about it. There was little doubt that the Pirates were on fire. With a record of 17 and 6 through May 1st, it was their best start in 51 years. Pittsburgh Pirates, 1988, a team and a city that is trying to recapture the golden day. So the stage is set here in Three River Stadium. The Pittsburgh Pirates, the Shockers in the National League against the Chicago Cubs on the game of the week. The Pirates were becoming big news. Big enough, in fact, for NBC television to return to Pittsburgh for the first time in years and a national audience tuned in to watch the Pirates rally. So the bases are loaded. One out in the eighth. It is 4-3 Chicago. Van Slyke at third. Bonilla at second and Reynolds at first. Two balls and two strikes with one out. Line drive, base hit into left center. In comes Van Slyke. Here comes Bonilla. to stand up and bellow. One and two, and this crowd on its feet. Boy, it's like the glory days have returned here. Ground ball to the hole. Belly Art, a long throw. Got him. It's April on the field and October in the grandstand. That's the scene here at Three Rivers. And for Chicago, another bitter the national scene was being drawn to the 88 Pittsburgh Pirates, who with their sensational turnaround had become baseball's big story. Grabbing most of the headlines was third baseman Bobby Bonilla, who was named player of the month for both April and May. Bobby Bonilla was one of the big stories in all of baseball beginning of the year. And, uh, you know, to put the numbers up that he put up, it was just, it was fantastic. Drive deep right field. Home run. Bobby with a drive to left field. Going back is Bradley on the warning track at the wall. The ball is gone. We've got a 5-5 ball game. And as he did last year for the first time, Lanny, one from the left and one from the right. He's like a heavyweight. If he doesn't hit you with a left, he'll pound you with a right. It was Bonilla's knockout punch that practically carried the Pirates through much of the first half of the season. Fans everywhere took notice and elected Bobby Bo as the National League starting third baseman in the All-Star game. Ironically, Bonilla's biggest challenge had been making the transition from the outfield to third base. 
With me being a big man, I definitely have to work on my footwork. I cannot catch a ball and throw like I'm in right field. Working alongside Bonilla was first base and infield coach Tommy Sant. Okay, right there. So you didn't go charge that blind, but you well, moved a little bit. Moved all right, you mo that's all. You move a little bit. Get rid of it. All right, babe. Good footwork. But it doesn't do you any good as soon as the ball's hit to get down and let it come that's to you. That's what I do. That's why I don't get to the court. That's when you get to the bad hop. To Bobby's credit, he's worked very hard at third, and uh, he's improved 100%, and he's going to get a lot better yet, I believe. He fits clothes when he throws. That a babe. Yeah, I'll take five on that one. Bonilla's hard work paid off early on as he sizzled at the hot corner. Breaking ball. Bobby has it in fair territory, writes himself, and throws him out. Oh, boy. That's as good as you'll see right there. Woo! But as the summer of 88 began to heat up, Bonilla's play, both in the field and at the plate, cooled off. In fairness to him, you know, he, he had a little bit of a slump, but, but he's, he carried his ball club for so many days. He, he had an outstanding season overall. Outstanding indeed. Bobby Bo drove in 100 runs in 88 and set career highs in eight offensive categories. He also broke his own pirate record for most home runs by a switch hitter with 24. A total that tied him for second on the club with Barry Bonds. Here's the next pitch. Bonds swings on a drive, right field, go ball, get out of here, it is gone! This is almost too good to be true. Barry Bonds with a pinch hit home run and a standing ovation for Barry. In just his second full season in the majors, Bonds continued to blossom into one of baseball's most talented players. Barry hit 283, scored 97 runs, and hit eight home runs, leading off the first inning. Barry Bonds, for the 16th time in his career, has let off a first inning with a home run. All that, despite being hampered by a knee injury sustained while making this remarkable catch in mid-June. Oh, great play by Bonds. And Barry appears to be shaken up. Still, Bonds and Bonilla together stung the opposition as Pittsburgh's version of the Killer Bees. <laughs> On May 6th, Pirates President Carl Barger joined Pirate fans in mourning the loss of Pittsburgh's Mayor Richard Caligiuri, whose relentless efforts helped keep the team in Pittsburgh. With his untimely death caused by the rare disease amyloidosis, the Pirates lost perhaps their biggest fan and most loyal supporter. In honor of the late mayor, the team dedicated the 1988 season to his memory. Appropriately, that night, the Pirates beat the Padres, winning on Sid Bream's homer in the bottom of the 12th. It's gone, home run, the Pirates win. And I think it's only fitting on a night when we remember a mayor who went through extra innings to keep Pirate baseball in the city of Pittsburgh that the Bucks go 12, and they beat San Diego the final. The Pirates four, the Padres one. The dramatic homer capped off a four RBI performance by Sid Bream, who had battled his way back from off-season knee surgery, convincing the Pirates that number five was the team's number one first baseman. After early season challenges for the starting job, Bream again earned regular status on Jim Leland's lineup card. And at one stretch in June, shared Player of the Week honors with San Francisco's Will Clark. Bream had an even stronger season defensively, with a sparkling 995 fielding percentage, second in the league. Also contributing to the team's early season surge was R.J. Reynolds. Fly ball into deep center field. 
Martinez to the warning track, to the wall, looks up, it's gone! Home run, R.J. Reynolds! Reynolds had a number of clutch hits in key situations throughout the season. His 11 pinch hit RBIs tied him for second in the majors. In addition, he swiped 15 bases in 17 tries. And as always, showed his versatility in the field with a more than capable glove. Catcher Mike Lavalier's glove was a welcome sight for pirate pitchers. A true student of the game, Spanky knows what it takes to keep the opposition off balance. Mistake breaking ball hitter. I mean, every now and then it'll club or a hanging slider or, you know, a hanging curveball or something like that. How do you just keep the ball down? Strawberry running. Here's the throw. On target and in time. He's out. Though known for his great defensive skills, Lavalier also gunned down opposing clubs with his bat, leading the team in hitting with runners in scoring position at 337. Lavalier's role became even more important when Junior Ortiz, while making a hustling play on July 27th in St. Louis, suffered a broken collarbone. The injury brought an end to a promising season for Junior, who finished the year with a 280 batting average. It was a bat that would certainly be missed in the Pirates lineup. 1988 was a banner year for Pirate pitchers. Case in point, on May 8th, Doug Drabeck took a no-hitter into the ninth inning against the Padres. One, two pitch, swing and a miss, strike three. There are now two outs in the eighth inning. I didn't really start thinking about it till probably the eighth inning. Here's the two strike pitch. Swing and a miss, strike three. For the third out was uh, Sean Abner. The fans started cheering and it hit me there and then I didn't try not to think about it in the dugout. I tried talking to people like Mike Dunn and John Smiley were sitting next to me. I talked to them a little just to keep it off my mind. And then when I went out for the ninth inning, I knew that here's a chance. Here's the pitch, ground ball up the middle. Pedrique diving stop, his throw to first base, not in time. He throws the ball over the head of Sid Bream. It'll be a base hit for Randy Reddy and that breaks up the no hitter. But Doug Drabeck with a no-hitter through eight innings here this afternoon, and he'll get a standing ovation. It was exciting. It didn't happen, but, uh, you know, who knows in the future. The future sure looks bright for Doug Drabeck, who won 10 of his last 12 decisions and led the staff with a career-high 15 wins. Winning came easy early in the season for Brian Fisher, who won his first four decisions but a shoulder injury would soon force him onto the disabled list. The shoulder has been bothering me since the middle of May, and um, I feel strong one time, and I feel weak the next time, and I know I would have been more of a contributor to the team. It was real disappointing. Despite hurting, Fisher came back and contributed some strong performances out of the bullpen. In 11 relief appearances, he was 2-0 with a 0.78 ERA. Well, he'll get a lot of high fives for the way he pitched tonight. After his spectacular rookie season, Mike Dunn's sophomore year proved to be frustrating. Dunn's an excellent pitcher, and uh, maybe there was something for him for the sophomore jinx, I don't know, but uh, we have big plans for him. We like him a lot. Dunn also spent nearly a month on the DL early in the season. Making big strides on the mound was 31-year-old Bob Walk, who put together his best season ever. Walk showed great command of his pitches. But it wasn't always that way. Uh, I saw Bob Walk uh, years ago in the minor leagues when I managed the AAA when he was pitching for Oklahoma City. I think the comparison is, is, is night and day. Bob Walk was a, a big, strong kid that could throw a ball through a wall, and sometimes that's where he threw it. But Walk refined his skills under the guidance of pitching coach Ray Miller. For the first time in life, Bob Walk stopped trying to throw every pitch so that the hitter could not make contact. Uh, once that happens, you become a pitcher, and it's really been helpful to him and helpful to me. And helpful to the Buckos. Walk won 12 games and earned himself a spot on the National League All-Star team. He's a professional. He knows what it's all about. He's a tough competitor and uh, definitely an asset to our ball club. Fireballing John Smiley was also proving valuable to the Bucks. Yeah! 
little extra right there. Hey, boy, Johnny. Hey, 2 0, you let up and hit the outside corner because you had to throw a strike. But that last pitch was yeah. about that much quicker with no effort. I mean, just a little bit extra right on the end. A little bit extra right on the end. Oh, boy. In only his first year as a starter, Smiley won 13 games and quickly became one of the league's dominant left handers. John already had an overpowering fastball, but his key to success was the development of a changeup and a curveball, which helped keep hitters guessing wrong. Swing and a miss, strike three. John Smiley had some very impressive outings. He won at the Montreal Expos on June 3rd and threw a two-hit shutout against St. Louis on September 21st. While John may seem quiet and reserved, once he takes the mound, he turns into one of the game's most fierce competitors. Brooks hit him and now Brooks charges the mound. Smiley drops his glove and says, come on, and they're going at it. John Smiley and Juve Brooks going toe to toe. And now but Smiley preferred strikeouts to knockouts, leading the team in K's with 129. And as was the case with all pitchers, Ray Miller played a key role in John's success. Down in the strike zone right here, in and out, change speeds, give me a ground ball. Take one hitter at a time from here on out. Just one hitter at a time. Don't worry about the base running because we'll get you some more. Okay, let's go. Miller's pitching philosophy is simple. Work fast, throw strikes, and change speeds. He also believes that for pitchers to perform at their best, they must be well conditioned, both physically and mentally. Part of that preparation is the charting of pitches, recording what the Pirates throw and what the opposition hits. In addition, Miller gets information from advanced scout Dom Scala. Yes. Just play it. Yeah. Well, he's an up the middle hitter yeah. most of the time. As you can see here, he's going he's gonna to go up the middle a lot. And then... Right after batting practice, I'll sit down with tonight's starting catcher and tonight's pitcher and we'll go through the uh, nine people in the lineup. Once the game begins, both Miller and Jim Leland are in perfect sync, making certain that the pitcher, catcher, and the entire defense work together as a team. We're man on second. They're getting kind of wide out there, and he's kind of okay. slow to the plate, so don't be afraid. You, you look okay. for this. Okay. Watch me play. You come set when he breaks, you throw. Okay. Okay. Anybody. Okay. They're all getting kind of crazy out there. I think he's the best. I think the pitchers have total confidence in him, and uh, he's done a great job for us. Did we get it straight, Ray? I think so. Right. I hope so. June 20th, the 68th game on the schedule, but the first between the Pirates and the New York Mets. It was a matchup long overdue. The Bucks were six and a half games back and anxious to get their first shot. But before they could meet the Mets, they were met by the media. <laughs> With all the hype aside, it was time to play ball. And on the mound, John Smiley faced the Mets' Bob Ojeda. Both pitched well, but it was just a matter of time before something would give. The big break came in the seventh inning. With the Bucks trailing three to two, the Mets unraveled. Ojeda has only one play to first. He threw it away. Reynolds to it, falling down a third, gets up. He'll score. The ball game is tied, and Bonds will score as well. Two runs score on the play. The Pirates take the lead. The Pirates added four runs to take an 8-3 lead, but then in the eighth, with New York mounting a rally of its own, Pittsburgh needed an out. Lean makes the play. Can he throw him out? Yes, he does. The Pirates went on to defeat New York 8-5, but their elation would be short-lived because runs would be hard to come by the next two games. In the second contest of the series, after an intentional walk to Darryl Strawberry, Kevin McReynolds hit a grand slam to help down the Bucks 9-0. Dwight Gooden finished off Pittsburgh in the finale, throwing eight scoreless innings in a 3-0 victory. It was enough to destroy the spirits of any team. But the 88 Bucks weren't just any team. They immediately went into Olympic Stadium and for the first time ever, swept four games from the Expos in Montreal. And during 
the series, there was the catch. Left center field, Vance Lake is on the move, and he diving catch in left center field. Oh, what a great play. That'll be on the highlight film. You can believe that. My first move was to left center, and that really was the big reason why I caught the ball. I got a, a great first two steps on the ball, and I accelerated and, and never gave up on the ball. At the last minute, uh, I knew there was no way I was going to catch the ball if I stayed on my feet, and the only ch chance I had, and I thought at the time was slim and none, was to dive, and I happened to dive in the right angle going back towards the Montreal bullpen and came up with the catch. It was a gold glove grab, one few others in baseball could have made. But with Andy Van Slyke, nothing is impossible. He plays the game the way it was meant to be played. In 1988, he hit 288 with 25 homers and 100 RBIs. Crossing the plate himself 101 times. He led the majors in triples with 15, the most by a Pirate in 44 years. Add to that 30 stolen bases and his selection to the All-Star team, and it's no wonder Andy was chosen by the Sporting News as the National League Player of the Year. He was also voted the most popular player by the fans and the most valuable Pirate player by his teammates. Incredibly, Van Slyke is never completely satisfied always striving for something better. And there's no reason why, with the ability that God's given me, that I can't improve on the things uh, that I don't do very well. And I'm going to make sure that I get better at those things that I don't do very well. His approach to the game is something like out of a Hitchcock movie. Known affectionately by his teammates as Norman, and he is always psyched about the game he plays. aside, Andy's many fans are crazy about him. It's been fun that I've been able to excite uh, 1.8 million people on the field, and, and to me, I get excited about that. And uh, I just hope it's something uh, that will continue, not only next year, but for a lot of years to come. Everybody kind of rose in anticipation, and Andy threw him out. On Monday, June 27th, Pittsburgh again was in the national spotlight as ABC TV focused in on the top two teams in the East. A head-to-head -head battle with the Bucks just four and a half games back of the New York Mets. In the bottom of the fourth, Dwight Gooden was clinging to a one-nothing lead when Andy Van Slyke stepped in. Three and two the count, one out, lead to second. And it's hit down the line. Fifth inning, Sid Bream at third, with Rafael Belliard at the plate. He swings away, faces it in the center field. The Pirates lead it 2-1. Ninth inning, and Jim Gott is one out away. The following night before a sellout crowd, the Mets turned the tables with three home runs and buried the Pirates five to two. On Wednesday night, it was Pittsburgh that was on the offensive. Fastball grounded up the middle into center field, base hit. Belliard scores. Destrani around third, he'll head to the plate. He scores, it's 4-3. The Bucks are right back in it. Pitch to Vance Slack. Drive down the right field line. Strawberry to the warning track. That ball's gone. Home run, Andy Vance Slack. The Pirates take the lead. 0-1 oh, pitch. Base hit. Center field. Lavalier scores. Here comes Belly out around third. 
Roger Dykstra throw to the plane. It is not in time. The Pirates lead 7-6. Chico's done it again. The Pirates took the 7-6 lead into the top of the ninth, and a jam-packed three rivers rocked. Jim Gott retired the first two batters, then jumped in front of Howard Johnson, one ball and two strikes. At that moment, I felt my heart was beating a little bit too fast. Things were going a little bit too quickly. I did not want to make a mistake. I stepped off the mound, called Spanky to come over. We got a chance to talk. I said, uh, what do you want here in this situation? I felt for sure we were going to go with the slider. He wanted to throw a curveball. I said, no, I'd like to go with the slider, and we broke up. I went right back there. Still the heat of the moment, the heart still pumping, thinking slider the whole way, and Mike puts down a fastball. And instead of stepping off and understanding what he wanted to do there, I just got the fastball grip and threw an unconscious pitch. Fly ball, deep right field. Going back is Reynolds, it is gone, and we are tied 7-7. The Mets went on to win a heartbreaker, 8-7. Understanding the impact of what that one pitch did made me reflect even more how important it is for me to go out there fully concentrated and focused on what my job is, throwing each pitch with conviction. Jim Gott threw not only with conviction, but with heat. His fastball clocked consistently at over 90 miles per hour, burned 76 batters in just over 77 innings. Got ready, here's the pitch. Gotcha, strike three, ball game's over. A breaking ball from Jim Gott. There was no doubt in Jim Leland's mind that Gott was his stopper. To work out of the bullpen, it takes an individual with a distinctive personality. Every day when I go down there, I usually bring down Rich and myself a Coke, and we just get a chance to relax. I've got gum and candy for everybody. You're the best. You're the greatest. Saturday in the park. Saturday was the 4th of July. Early in the game, Jim is the life of the pen. But as his time nears, a transformation takes place. Now he's concentrating totally on the game. What the situation is, looking ahead to the hitters he might face. After warming up, the call is not far away as he and bullpen coach Rich Donnelly go over the hitters one more time. They got O'Malley first, they said just pound him in hook. They're gonna throw a breaking ball, he's gonna throw a hard one. He's a, he likes slow breaking balls. Imagine you're going to see Wally Johnson in there, too. Same way with him. He's a fastball here. Let's go, Jim Bolton. Jim Gott wrote himself into the Pirate record book by surpassing Kent Tacovi's single-season save record of 31. He finished the year with 34. Robinson in a hurry. Being called on 75 times was Jeff Robinson, who did everything that was asked of him. One of the most durable and well-conditioned pitchers in baseball, Robinson led all Major League relievers in innings pitched and was tied for second in the National League in appearances. He also set a career high with 11 wins, most by a Pirate reliever in six years. Jim Leland told me that my job is, uh, is to get people out, so, you know, there's how can I argue with that? There was no argument from Bob Kipper when he was moved from the starting rotation into the bullpen. I've had to handle a lot of different roles this year, you know, long, middle, and short relief. My attitude was pretty much just go out and do the job whenever and whatever it is. Kipper, as well as the rest of the Pirate relievers, did the job in 88. The Pirates were 71-1 and one when leading after eight innings, and they combined for 46 saves, most by a bucko bullpen since 1979, giving the starters confidence that there would always be help on the way. The season had reached the critical stage. The Pirates needed a win out west to keep the race interesting in the east. And when they did, reeling off nine in a row, their longest streak of the season. Win number one came in San Diego, and Andy Van Slyke was the hero. Home run, Andy Van Slyke puts the Pirates in front three to two. There's a base into center field by Santiago. Coming around third is Kruk, and Van Slyke throw to the plate. is untimely, I got him. Junior Ortiz holds onto the ball. John Smiley struck out nine in the second win at San Diego. 
John Smiley strikes out the side. Jeff Robinson and Jim Gott finished off the Padres. Jim Gott gets them, sets them down in the ninth inning. The Pirates take two out of three. The third straight win came in L.A. Green. Spanky and Barry bomb the Dodgers for four in a row. That ball is near the foul pole, and it is gone. A three-run homer by Mike LaValliere. The Pirates lead three to nothing in the fourth inning. On to the drive to right field. Back is Marshall. This one's going to be up for the seats. Another three-run homer, and the Pirates lead it six to nothing. The Bucks made it five straight with a sweep of the Dodgers and a 7-2 win over Oral Hershiser. Base loaded, one out, Pirates two, Dodgers one, sixth inning. Base hit, center field. Line scores, 3-1, Pirates hands, slide will cross the plate, the Buccos lead 4-1. to one. R.J. Reynolds with three runs batted in today. Bouncer to Gonzalez. To Belliard at second on the first, a game-ending double play. The Pirates defeat Los Angeles, and there was no doubt about it. The Bucks were on a roll, but timeout. For more headlines, as Bobby Bonilla, Andy Van Slyke, and Bob Walk head to Cincinnati to represent Pittsburgh in the 88 All-Star Game. Andy Van Slyke was at his best even before the game, seizing the opportunity to test his humor on a number of reporters. Well, considering I've uh, had two hours sleep and had a flat tire, uh, alarm didn't go off, my kids are screaming at me. Signing five million baseballs and talking to 12 million reporters, I'm having a great time. <laughs> Bobby Bo was simply trying to take it all in. I just want to concentrate on relaxing these three days and enjoying it all. And Bob Walk, he was happy to be there. Right now, I'm just uh, kind of in shock, more or less. In the game, Walk pits to just one batter, but did the job getting the National League out of a jam. When I went out there, I was just kind of wanted to throw strikes and, and, and make the guy hit the ball. That's kind of like how I pitch usually, but that's what I wanted to do tonight. Bobby Bonilla started at third base for the National League, the first Pirate starter in seven years. He played the entire game and turned in a solid performance. It's everything they said it would be and more. I mean, I, I'm glad I had the opportunity and the fans voted me to start in the game. It's something I'll never forget. Not surprisingly, Andy Van Slyke made an unforgettable catch late in the game. It was super. Uh, I haven't had, had that kind of adrenaline since the World Series in 85, and it was just a great feeling to be out there. It was opening day two back home in Pittsburgh, the start of the second half of the season, and the Bucks picked up where they left off, beating the Giants 9-2. to Russell from the stretch. Van Slyke grounds it fair down the right field line. Bond scored easily. It's into the corner. Belliard will be waved around third. Van Slyke rounds second. He's on his way to third. There's no throw. And ball game is tied. 2-2. Andy swings in the 2 0 pitch and a fly ball to center field. Brett Butler is going back. It's back on the warning track and the ball's off the base of the wall. And Andy with two triples tonight and four runs batted in. The Pirates lead the San Francisco Giants. Nine to two. The Pirates made it seven in a row when Bobby Bow broke a 5-5 tie in the fifth. Pitch to Bonilla. Swung on fly ball, deep right field. Back is Maldonado, no chance. That ball's up in the seats, off the facade. Bobby Bonilla gives the Pirates the lead. The following night, the Bucks pounded San Francisco 10 to one to make it eight straight. He will score, Vance Light goes to third. A two-run single by Sid Reed. Coming on, Vance Light quickly, and he diving catch, he's done it again. Barry has the sign for LaValliere, winds, kicks, and deals. Ground ball is short, this should do it. Belly Ives throw to first base to the start, and the ball game's over. The Pirates win their eighth in a row. It's nine in a row, and a sweep of the Giants after Barry Bonds delivers with a dramatic eighth inning pinch hit home run. Go ball, get out of here, it is gone! Barry Bonds with a two-run homer, and the Pirates lead the San Francisco Giants five to three. The nine-game winning streak was a clear reflection of manager Jim Leland and how he was able to keep his Bucks believing in themselves throughout the long summer. Psychology plays a big part in Leland's game plan, as does preparation. 
McGee's always hit it anywhere. Charts that I got here show that uh, show that he's hit basically the right center, left center. I think he's got to make sure infielders don't play too deep. They do. He'll be able to throw yeah, them yeah, yeah high, any high bouncer or stuff like that is a base hit. You got to make sure that uh, Fermin doesn't get too deep at shortstop because he can. He, he may catch the ball in the hole, but he's not going to throw any of those guys out. So make sure that he shortens up just a little bit so he gets any routine ground ball. they got to be out at first because it's going to be a bang-bang play if he's lazy with it at all. Make sure you tell Felix. There it is. Now turn it. Now turn it one time. Yes, sir. Hello, Chico. Nice play, buddy. Leland treats his players with the same respect he has earned from them. And the thing that impressed me most about Jim Lee is he treated me as a person first and a player second. And uh, I respect that. And I respect that more about him than anything else. Still, take that. The only way we're going to make it is if we stay as a team, if we work together. Very rare that the enemy beats you, you self destruct. I preach that to my team almost monthly. He has quickly become known as one of baseball's best field leaders. In fact, Sports Illustrated rated him first among all managers in preparing and teaching. At season's end, the Sporting News named Leland co-manager of the year, along with Tommy Lasorda of the world champion Dodgers. I credit the coaches with a lot of that, and I also credit the quality of our, of our players. For whatever reason, this team never quit, and it hasn't yet, and, and I, I'm proud of that. Gott studies the side from LaValliere, nods affirmatively. Now from the stretch, the 0-2 pitch, got him! Jim Gott strikes out Jeff Hamilton, the ball game is over. The Pirates only a half game out of first place. It was July 21st, and the Bucks were 56 and 38. 18 games over 500 their high water mark for the year. But just when things were going well, the Bucks were drained by the drought. The team suddenly stopped hitting and would see little offensive relief for weeks. It was an inopportune time to be playing the Mets. In the next eight encounters against New York, the Pirates would score just three runs or less in seven of those meetings. He records the last out. His homer won it for the Mets. one nothing. the final. The dog days of August were taking their toll on the Young Bucks. August 19th, Mike Diaz is traded to the Chicago White Sox for outfielder Gary Reedus and some of the Pirates say goodbye to Rambo. In his two and a half seasons with the Bucks, Rambo had indeed become a fan favorite, and it was tough to see such a popular player leave. But he wasn't the first to be dealt in 88. On July 21st, the Bucks traded outfielder Darnell Coles to Seattle for outfielder Glenn Wilson, who was anxious to be a Pittsburgh Pirate. I know I'm happy to be here, and I think that they're happy to have me, at least that's all indications that I get, and uh, it's nice to be welcome again. There's a drive into right field, Wilson moving over, he makes a diving catch, he's got a chance to double him off at first, they will do it with ease. A double play, a brilliant play in right field by Glenn Wilson. This uh, winning attitude that's been developed in Pittsburgh over the last two years has just been uh, outstanding. I, I very much want to be a part of this. Three weeks after the Wilson deal, Reliever Barry Jones was traded to the Chicago White Sox for veteran starter Dave LaPointe. I played on the World Championship team before in 82 with St. Louis, and this team has much more talent all the way around. A good manager and good coaches that try and help you out. Not only can they win one year, everybody's so young that uh, I've said it earlier, this could become a dynasty here. LaPointe's addition to the rotation brought a different look to the staff from the left side of the mound and his speedy delivery always kept the fans and players on their toes. The Bucks obtained infielder Ken Obertfell from the Braves on August 27th, giving them an experienced bat off the bench. Round ball, base hit right field. Here comes Belliard around third up with the ball to Strawberry. The throw to the plate is not in time. Belliard scores, and it's a 3-3 ball game. Kenny Obertfell with a pinch hit single to right field to tie the game up. 
Bobby Cox came in to me and told me that I'd been traded to the Pirates, I thought I had a new lease on life. I was very excited about the trade, and uh, this is a good club to be in. Though the club would never get closer to the top spot of the East, it did have to hang tough in the final month of the season in order to secure second place. And the Scrappy Bucks battled all the way. And we were treated to those acrobatic grabs that only Chico could make. Jose leaned his poetry in motion. The Bucks' lucky number 13 led all National League second baseman in total chances with 816. Ground ball, Lee diving. Can he get up and throw him out? Yes, good play by Jose Lee. Woo! But Chico is well versed in all phases of the game. Jose Leand is sure to be a safe fixture at second base for years to come. Though there was no real fixture at shortstop, Rafael Belliar did play in over 120 games in 88, leading all National League shortstops in fielding percentage. The first Pirate shortstop to do so since 1980. Also spending time at short were Al Pedrique and Felix Fermin, who hit 294 in the last month of the season. But no matter who was at short, don't worry, Chico could harmonize with anybody. Ain't got no cash, ain't got no star. Ain't got no one who make me smile. So don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Be happy, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. If you find you have some trouble, don't you worry, you'll make it double. Don't worry, be happy. Don't worry, be happy. One more thing, guys. Be happy. Happy. Don't worry, be happy. Yeah. <laughs> Even President Reagan was happy to get into the Pirates Act in 88. Wind up, here comes the pitch. And there goes a hard hit ball out into right field and taken right off the grass for an out. The Bucks were glad to see a number of other players make some noise in 88. John Cangelosi, despite spending some time on the disabled list and in Buffalo, hit 344 after his recall from AAA in early August. Other young players heard from included Orestes Destrada, Benny DiStefano, Denny Gonzalez, and Tom Prince. And there were young pitchers like Randy Kramer, Morris Madden, Scott Medvin, and Rick Reed. On November 7, 1988, the Pirates announced their new senior vice president and general manager of baseball operations. I would like to uh, introduce to you Mr. Larry Doty. Thank you, Mr. Barger. I'm very pleased to be a part of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Doty had been the team's interim general manager following Sid Thrift's dismissal in early October. Obviously, Sid Thrift was, is and, and was a great baseball mind. He made many, many significant contributions to, to our organization and where we are today. I would not purport to minimize those in the slightest. At the same time, uh, there was considerable areas of disagreement relative to Sid's definition of what his job was. 
we tried to resolve that. We spent the better part of a year trying to resolve that. Uh, and, but the, the differences were, were very significant. Uh, we felt that we had to build a team where each member of the team could do their job uh, and that that did not uh, pose a threat to anyone else. Uh, Sid looked at it in a different way. Uh, it led to the ultimate decision. It was a tragic decision because it put a taint in what was otherwise a marvelous year for the entire organization. Doty spent 17 years with the Cincinnati Reds and is well respected for his ability to evaluate talent and he shares many of Thrift's ideas. First of all, I found the philosophy of how the Pittsburgh Pirates approach baseball to be consistent with what I believed. My simple philosophy in baseball is uh, look for good athletes, develop them through your farm system, try to find the type of athletes that are uh, built on speed and power. Well, we certainly are on, on course. As a matter of fact, I personally don't think we've skipped a beat. And what we set out to do early on was create something that would keep baseball in Pittsburgh for generations to come. The Pirates have certainly generated a new enthusiasm for baseball, as evidenced by record-breaking numbers in 1988. Three sellouts during the season, including the largest crowd ever to see a baseball game in Pittsburgh on opening night. The largest three and four game series crowds ever. 21 crowds of over 30,000. And on September the 8th, the Bucks surpassed their previous single season attendance record set back in 1960. And for the year, a total of 1,865,713 fans passed through the turnstiles at Three Rivers. But most of all, there was great play on the field, reflected in some individual postseason honors handed out to the likes of Jim Leland, the Sporting News National League Co-Manager of the Year, Mike Lavalier, Sporting News National League All-Star Catcher, Bobby Bonilla, Sporting News National League All-Star Third Baseman and Silver Slugger, and Andy Van Slyke, the Sporting News National League Player of the Year and Silver Slugger. And the team as a whole finished in second place in 1988, its highest finish since 1983. The 85 and 75 record was the club's best since 1979. Some have referred to the Pittsburgh Pirates as baseball's version of the Chrysler story. But to their fans, the Bucks are simply a team that has earned back respect and admiration. A serious contender in the National League East. A team that is truly proud again. First, 4-3 Pirates, seventh inning. Bobby swings and drives deep to right field. There's no doubt about it. It is gone. The Pirates lead the Dodgers. 7-3. Pitch line, drive down the right field line, base hit. Lead will score. Van Slyke on his way to third. He'll be waved home. Reynolds at second base, headed for third. He's there with a two-run triple. The Pirates lead it 3-1. There's a fly ball into right center field, moving over Van Slyke, and a running grab by Andy, leaping at the last second to haul it in. Just another Van Slyke gem. The pitch, a line drive. Feared by Chico Lean as he leaps in the air at second base. Lean takes a hit and maybe a run away from the Braves with a great play at second base. Fly ball into shallow center field. Wilson coming on, and a diving catch by Glenn. The inning is over. Pitch to him high in the air, deep to right field. Win to the warning track, to the wall, looks up, 